was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That was epic. Oh my goodness. Welcome to the Creation Today Show. I'm your host, Eric Hovind. I love talking about creation evolution. You know, some people say it's 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 never worth really getting into an argument over creation versus evolution because all you're really doing is comparing apples and origins. Oh, don't worry. It will get better from that. Okay. I promise you because, uh, well, not because of me, but because I do have a guest today that you're going to absolutely love. Hey, if you joined the live show early enough, you just saw a portion of Genesis Paradise Lost. It's called In Six Days, and it is a great, powerful film. It's part of the full Genesis Paradise Lost movie that went into theaters just a couple years ago. And I want to give away several copies of this to some of you that are joining me live right now, all you have to do is make a comment on this video right now and tell us what is your favorite animal that God created. All you got to do is put that in the comments and that automatically enters you to win a copy of this film. Uh, you're trying to impress the ladies in the office over there. So I, I would, I think going with something cute. And if anybody says giraffe my sister marlissa will absolutely want to pick you because well that's her favorite animal um small and cute is amanda's i don't know what kent cares about but i guess we'll find out uh so glad you guys are joining me thank you i love having these conversations today we're having the conversation does the hebrew bible teach six day creation uh, by the way if you don't win uh your copy of this don't don't worry you, you can you can always support the ministry just go to creationtoday.org and grab your own copy you will thoroughly enjoy that. So today I want to ask the question, does the Hebrew Bible teach a six-day creation? I'm curious what you think about that. I hear some people and even scholars say, yes, absolutely. I hear other people and even scholars say, no, it does not teach six-day creation. I hear people and yes, even scholars say, we can't really know what the Hebrew Bible teaches about the days of creation. Well, today we're going to answer that question, and we're going to go straight to the Bible, and we're going to go to the Hebrew and actually answer that question for us and for you. My guest today uh, earned his PhD in Hebrew studies from Cambridge University. He's an associate professor of Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. His interests include, which I love, biblical theology, focusing on Genesis chapters 1 through 3, exegesis within the Old Testament, uh, and the Doctrines of Grace. What a beautiful, beautiful thing to study. Authored several books. I'll tell you about them here in just a second. It's none other than God's humble servant, Dr. Jonathan Gibson. Dr. Gibson, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Uh, you got a beautiful accent there. That's, uh, it sounds, uh, it's not Australian. Which one is that you got there? I, I uh, like to joke with people here. Uh, it's uh, from Texas, but they don't hate me. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the one. That's yeah, the one. That, that's, that's what you're thinking of. Uh, it's from Belfast, Northern Ireland. Wow, beautiful. A lot of great men have come from there and thinkers and, and preachers and unbelievable. Well, I am glad God has used you to study so much. And I'm just so thankful that you're joining us to have this conversation. I did a poll on Instagram before we got started, went up this morning and asked people, hey, what does the Hebrew Bible teach about six-day creation? And does it teach billions of years? Does it teach six days? Or do we not know for sure? And I think this will tell you a little bit about my audience. For the most part, my audience is saying 87%, hey, it teaches six days. 13% said, well, it doesn't really say for sure. Nobody in my audience immediately just this morning said it's billions of years, but I interact with a lot of people and there's a lot of people in Christianity that would say billions of years. So uh, I, I want to get into this, but but before I do, you, you do know the original Hebrew language, right? You've got that kind of down. You had to do a few years of study on that? Uh, just a few years. Yeah. Lot, <laughs> lots of years. How long have you been studying Hebrew? I first started learning it in 2005 when I went to study at Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia. So I did four years there, and then I did a PhD for four years. So that's another four. And then I've been teaching it here at Westminster coming up six years. Oh, my goodness. So 
You got it down. We could put up the Hebrew and you could read it no problem at this point in your in your life. It d- depends which part of the Old Testament, but yes, I'm <laughs> thankful to be able to read uh, uh, the Bible in its original language. That is a beautiful thing. I got the alphabet and a little bit more, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. But it, after that, I was like, okay, I, I really need to go back and apply myself. Okay, so we speak English. Yeah, I mean, originally, this is written in Hebrew thousands of years ago. Can, can we start by just give us some background on the Hebrew language? Can we really know what it means, and can we be confident in, in, in what we know of Hebrew, the old Hebrew versus new Hebrew? Like, can, can we know? Can you give us that background? Yeah, so Hebrews, uh, biblical Hebrew is an oriental language uh, that was <clears throat> uh, um, spoken in the Fertile Crescent area, the Mesopotamia area, what we would today know as the Middle East. Uh, there's three branches of it. There was East Semitic, which was like Akkadian, Assyria, Babylon, uh, spoke that. Then there was the Northwest Semitic, uh, where you get um, the Canaanite language uh, there. And a dialect of Canaanite language was the Hebrew language. <clears throat> and, um, and then you have um, the South Semitic, which is Arabic and e- Ethiopic. So Hebrew comes from that family of Semitic languages. Uh, it was... Um, used spoken by god's people and uh, then moses uh, wrote the first five books of the bible in the hebrew language um the bible came down to us through prophets uh writing down in hebrew and then we have manuscripts called the dead sea scrolls that precede christ and we see the tradition of copying these manuscripts and circulating them among the jewish community uh, we also have the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the Hebrew, which predates Christ. So what that tells us is that even from its earliest days, uh, just before Christ, the, the Hebrew Bible was understood. It was readable. It was translatable. Uh, if you have Greek uh, translators actually trying to translate it into their own language, there's also the Syriac, the Arabic, uh, the Ethiopic, the Latin versions. They're all early translations of the Hebrew. So that tells us the Hebrew is readable, it's translatable, and therefore it's understandable. Was this kind of the common, did a lot of books get translated like this, or is this pretty unique to to what we call scripture and what Jesus referred to as scripture? Or is it like, oh man, they copied and they they translated into the different languages lots and lots of different authors? Uh, That's sort of outside my area of... Expertise, but I would say it is unique that this was the first book, I think, the first codex really to get uh, translated in full. Um, so that that in and of itself is unique. Now, the Hebrew Bible, obviously, is specifically talking about creation, uh, has has developed several different views on. Okay, what is the Hebrew Bible saying in Genesis? And today, I hope by the end of our time together, we we can go through some of the different views and lay out, can we get a definite, you know, it seems to be the Hebrew Bible is teaching this. Can I, can I ask, what are your thoughts on why there are different views of what the Hebrew Bible is actually saying? Um, yeah, I, I think because the Old Testament, if you start with the end of the Old Testament, um, which is just a few hundred years before Christ, and the events that occur there, like the invasion of the Babylonians, uh, like the exile, um, like the return of the uh, Israelites, the Judaites to Jerusalem by King Cyrus. Uh, we have some extra biblical inscriptions, documents, etc., that actually confirm these events and the dates roughly. Uh, but the further you go back in the Old Testament, sort of the older the history is, the older the earth is, uh, we have less extra biblical uh, manuscripts, inscriptions, etc. We have a few things connected to the Exodus, uh, but apart from that, pre that, now you're into really uh, unknown territory. So Genesis uh, is a kind of creation, just by the fact that if you follow the biblical narrative, man wasn't created until day six. So there literally was nobody around to witness these events and document them. So I think we have that a problem uh, or circumstance, if you like, that pr- that makes it hard to prove the historicity of the Genesis account, except uh, except by accepting uh, the divine revelation as recorded in Genesis one. So that's, I think, one reason. 
the second is uh, the scientific consensus of our day. Uh, we are told repeatedly we must believe the science and um, the scientific consensus today is that the, the earth is old. Uh, it started with a big bang billions of years ago and that life on earth came about through evolution. Darwin's theory of evolution is still, I think, the dominant theory today in science. Um, so paleontology, geology, um, anthropology, all of these things are based on the presupposition of a very old earth and the evolutionary origins of man on the earth. And when you set that consensus against the Bible, then the two don't really seem to sync um, and they seem at odds with each other. And I think what's happened over uh, the century since the Enlightenment, since we've had this scientific revolution, is Christians and pastors and scholars have sought to try to reconcile those two perspectives. The Genesis narrative of chapter one that gives us the account of the creation week and also uh, the scientific consensus. And so I think that's really where the plethora of interpretations on Genesis 1 has arisen from. Now, pre the Enlightenment, there were a few exceptions in church history. Origen, early church father, Augustine, early church father, Anselm, uh, uh, medieval Christian theologian. They held to different interpretations of the account of Genesis, basically figurative views of the days. But apart from them, they really were the exception. They really were in the minority. The dominant view all the way from the early church through to the Enlightenment, and even since the Enlightenment, uh, is, uh, has been the literal interpretation. But the plethora of different interpretations, I think, really spawned after the scientific uh, revolution from the Enlightenment. It's interesting. I, I took a call yesterday from a friend of mine who is an old earth creationist would follow Hugh Ross's teachings and had just left a conference, a big conference where Hugh Ross and William Lynn Craig and a bunch of guys were at just this last week. And he said, Eric, I got to tell you, it's frustrating. We're watching some of these guys adopt a very evolution worldview. And he's totally against the evolution worldview, bringing that into the Bible, but he is in favor of the old earth worldview. And I, and I told him a story. I said, listen, I just had a conversation with Dr. Ross in January and I was trying to think, how do I get him to, to admit that it's the science influencing his view of scripture? And so I told him, here's the question I asked. I said, Dr. Ross, if all the scientists tomorrow changed their mind and said, you know what, we were wrong. The science is clear. The earth and the universe are young. I said, would that change your interpretation of scripture? And Dr. Ross said, absolutely. Yes, it would. And I told my friend, I said, the same point I'm making to you is the same point I was trying to make to Dr. Ross. That's the point. You're using science and putting that over, <laughs> modern science, putting that over scripture to make the interpretation and yet denying it at the same time. And as we talked, I, I, he said, hey, there was, you know, there had to be death before sin. We're going through that big problem. And I said, listen, if you have that, you have, and I was going to save this story, but I think it's worth it. One of the arguments, you have animals eating animals before sin. And the Bible makes it clear that God gave everything, vegetables, fruit, herb of the earth to eat. And he said, you know, Eric, you, you've thought about it a lot more than I have. And I've not broken it down as to what others might, you know, what other animals have been on the planet. And then he goes, my personal belief is that there were animals already on the planet like dinosaurs. And the reason I say that is, and he paused and he goes, um, well, mainly it has to do with, uh, okay, I have to say it, the modern scientific perspective. And I went, exactly, that's, that's kind of the point. So when we look at the number of people that have created different views, it's mainly been since the old earth interpretation, 1795, James Hutton, it's mainly been since then that a plethora, as you say, of different views on Genesis have been created. Uh, yes, I think so. And um, I was speaking to a science a scientist years ago, a biblical scholar and scientist, and uh, he made the point to me, he said, if you follow carefully the arguments in the literature, articles, books, uh, etc., for explanations of the days of creation, he says somewhere 
you will find some sort of hat tip to the scientific consensus or to an old earth or or something in which they're clearly trying to bring the Bible into line with it. And I'd never thought of it that it, uh, in that way. And sure enough, since then, I've always sort of gone looking. If I'm reading somebody who has an alternative view of the days of creation, I, I sort of look in the footnotes or somewhere in the argument, is there somewhere where they're really trying to say, and this therefore can fit with the scientific consensus. One example would be Meredith Klein uh, in his articles um, on cosmogony uh, written in the early 2000s. And um, you get to the very end of the article and he's arguing from the text. He, he says, this is a purely exegetical argument from Genesis one. He presents the literary framework where the days match day one to three are realms, days four to six are rulers in the realms. So he has this elaborate literary framework where he thinks the text of Genesis 1 should be topicalized, not chronologized. And um, at the very end, as he's arguing, saying this is a purely exegetical argument, at the very end, footnote 47, the last footnote in the paper, and such a view does not discountenance the evolutionary origins of Adam. Then he goes on to affirm the historicity of Adam, saying he was a real historical person, but he opens the door to the evolutionary orange origins of Adam. And I just always remember that comment by that um, uh, biblical scholar and scientist to me that if you look carefully, there will be somewhere where there's some hat tip to um, the science. Now, it's not that we want to um, not engage with the science. I, I'm a Christian who believes that there is good science out there. The question then just becomes, which science are we talking about? Because uh, it, it, science is really determined by your presuppositions. And so your scientific conclusions are determined by your assumptions and presuppositions. So it's not that we want to come across as anti-science. I'm very pro-science. The question is, which science are we talking about? And I've got no problem listening to scientists and their and, and heeding their counsel and uh, uh, wisdom, but Scripture is the final authority, and not not science. And so we really need to return to that great Reformation principle of sola scriptura, that the Bible is the final authority. It's not the only authority. It's not solo scripture. It's sola scripture. It's the final authority of other authorities. And uh, I think that's uh, really what this comes down to is, are, are we returning back to what the Bible says or to what science says? If you guys can't already tell, you probably would love to sit under Dr. Gibson's teaching. Uh, and oh my goodness, I just, I love the way you teach. I love the knowledge that you have and that you're imparting it to others. Hey, if you're joining me uh, live right now, we are doing a giveaway. Uh, it'll be happening here real soon. You need to put in the comments, we're giving away in six days. Uh, a film that we showed right there at the beginning or a little clip of it. Just comment your favorite animal. And here in just a minute, we'll uh, give away a couple things. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. If you're joining me on TV or if you're uh, listening to the podcast, thank you guys for joining the Creation Today show. We're just a group of people that are that are really trying to get answers to questions so that we can be all that God has called us to be. We find many people have stumbling blocks to coming to Christ, and we want to turn those into stepping stones on their journey and help them realize you really can't trust the truth of God's Word. Dr. Gibson, I'm curious, why do you come to a literal interpretation of the days? I mean, were, were some of the other views, like, were they enticing at some point or was it, did you always see through it? And, and like, how did you come to the six days of Genesis in Hebrew are talking about six literal days, 24 hour days? Uh, yeah, I was brought up in an in a evangelical uh, home, Christian home that uh, believed uh, the Bible and taught it. And I was taught the literal view growing up. When I entered my early twenties, uh, I started reading uh, a number of other books and scholars. And I sort of decided in my mid twenties or so that it just really wasn't that important. Uh, and I sort of find the day age view enticing, the analogical view. I liked some of the literary framework. Um, so I sort of uh, arrived at my uh, more college as a sort of a, open to all sort of perspectives on it, not wanting to be too <clears throat> hardcore. Uh, then we, then I studied Hebrew and then since then, I've sort of studied the text of Genesis 1-1 and I've come back basically to my 
uh, conviction, my original conviction, that the literal interpretation of the days of creation is the most sensible, the most reasonable, and it is the interpretation that's been held as the dominant view throughout the history of the church. Uh, so that's how I arrived at it. it, was going back to the Hebrew, studying it more carefully, and uh, you know, being able to actually then critique some of the more uh, simplistic arguments. For example, some people say, well, Genesis 1 is very poetic. There's a lot of rhythm and cyc cyclical patterns, and therefore it's clearly not meant to be read as history, as prose. It's clearly poetic. But, but having studied Hebrew, uh, I've seen that actually it is prose. It can't be Hebrew poetry. Um, and things like that sort of helped me move away from some of those more simplistic arguments so yeah it was going back to the hebrew and being convinced from the hebrew now it's not that i would say the hebrew proves that it's six literal days at the end of the day we have to interpret the hebrew and very able and better hebraists than me interpret it differently to me all i would argue is that i think the interpretation the literal interpretation is the most reasonable sensible in light of the the the, the text and as I said, has been the dominant view throughout the history of the church. So I think it's about how to interpret it in a common sense way uh, with what we have in front of us. And, and yes, knowing the Hebrew text brings out some of the clarity better. For just one example, uh, there's a Hebrew verb form used in Genesis 1 called a vayiktol verb form, a vav, consecutive, imperfect. It's the verb form that... Um, conveys a chronology in a narrative, uh, uh, the, consec the sequence in a narrative. And from Genesis 1-3 to Genesis 2-3, you have 55 vayiktols. Uh, and they're in an unbroken chain, really. Uh, there's no going off them off that main line chain for you know five to ten verses, which happens in chapter 2 when there's the comments about the river uh, the float out of Eden, that all takes you off the main line. There's a break in the narrative. And then Adam gets put in the garden a second time. He, he wasn't literally put in the garden a second time. It's just the narrative picks up where it left off. That's an example of a break in a narrative in chapter two. But in chapter one, there's no such break. And seeing those that string of 55 vayiktols, uh helped me realize that this really is a to be read as a chronological uh, consecutive narrative and not something that has uh, time uh, removed from it. It really is a temporal uh, chronological text in that regard. So, so that, 55 in, in a matter of 30 some verses, like, can you, can you read and give us some examples of there, there's one right there and there's one right there. Yeah. Well, the first one is Vayomer uh, Elohim and God said uh, that there's your first uh, narrative. And then God saw uh, Vayar Elohim. And God separated, there's the next one. And God called, there's the next one. So these are the verbs that are like the nice. backbone of the narrative. And they're called vav consecutive imperfects. And there's the key word, consecutive. They're just one verb after another that carries the narrative in its logical temporal sequence. And so it's very hard to then, as some people like to do, like Meredith Klein, to say, well, it's, it's to be topicalized, not... Uh, chronologized and so he wants to match days four and day one together day five and day two together day six and day three together and to do so you break the chronology of that string of 55 vayiktols it's just not the way to read a narrative in, in the hebrew and then there's the issue of the ordinal numbers not the cardinal cardinal numbers are one two three four five six seven ordinal numbers are first second third fourth fifth sixth seventh and the text comes to us with ordinal numbers, not cardinal numbers. And so to talk about day one matching day four, we're not really talking in the language of Genesis 1. It's the first day and the fourth day. That's the only way that the text actually speaks about the day. So ordinal numbers, uh, the string of vayiktols, things like that uh, really do convey that this is a um, se sequential narrative to be read uh, in that way as a seven-day chronological week. Well, I want to go through some of the different um, old earth interpretations. So some people have looked at it and said, well, maybe it means this, or maybe this means this, or maybe 
Maybe, you know, Adam had to actually till the garden, work the garden, and then he's like, this is hard. And God's like, okay, I need to make a wife for you. Okay, I want to go through some of those. But first, um, Facebook and YouTube, I'm going to have to let you go here in just a second. Before I do, let me do some giveaways. We're giving away in six days. Uh, if you made it early enough to the, to the live show and, and logged in a little bit early at creationtoday.org, you got to see some of this. It is a powerful look where you don't just hear the Bible being uh, read, you watch it unfolding, uh, part of Genesis Paradise Lost, a film we did. If you're on our YouTube channel, uh, I don't know how to say this, but uh, Crumble, K-E-R-R-U-M-B-L-E, you need to send us an email. Crumble, you need to send us an email, comments at creationtoday.org, comments at creationtoday.org. Genesis Facebook page, uh, Ava Isbell, uh, I-S-B-E-L-L. If you're watching, send us a message. Comments at creationtoday.org. We're going to send that to you for free right now. Richard, uh, L-I-N-C-K on the Eric Hoven Facebook page. Richard Link, uh, you get this. And then on the Creation Today page, Brian Michael uh, Cessna. I'm terrible with pronunciation. That's why I think Hebrew would be really, really hard for me, Doc. Uh, C-E-S-S-N-A, you are the winner. And for our Creation Today partners, man, look at all you guys on here. Isn't this fascinating? I love it. They're being so kind. Debbie, Cheryl, Kevin, Lisa, and Andrew are all getting one. Guys, Nate Loper said, Pachycephalosaurus. Why aren't you giving him one? You guys got to send this to Nate. I love Nate. I love all you guys. By the way, uh, shout out, man. I had a great time with several Creation Today partners at this last training I got to do. Uh, okay, Nate, they just added you, buddy. You're you're good now. You're going to get it. Uh, so PK, shout out. Thanks for hanging out with me this last week. I think we learned a lot and excited about the future of creation ministry with so many amazing people. Tom, I know you don't get to join me live anymore, but thank you, buddy, for hanging out with me last week. Certainly, certainly appreciate it. Hey, Facebook and YouTube, this has been fun. If you want to continue the conversation with us and be able to interact with Dr. Gibson or our other guests, you need to go to creationtoday.org and just partner with us. Uh, help us reach the world and you get behind the scenes access. We sure appreciate our partners. Next week, going to have a great conversation. I'm talking to Russ Miller. Uh, he is an off-grid creationist, a phenomenal communicator on the truths of Scripture, goes and travels around the world. You're going to love this kind of sit back, relax conversation I got to have uh, with Russ Miller next week. All right. So Facebook and YouTube, thanks for joining me. Come on over to creationtoday.org if you want the rest of this conversation as we walk through some of the old earth views. All right, Dr. Gibson, I, to me, I feel like we've just, I've done the introduction, which I hope would take about five minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, there's so much more to talk about when we talk about the different older views and how they try to add time to the Bible. 